Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. In this episode, we sit down with Ariel Gabizan to talk about some of his work in cryptography, his path through Zcash, and some of his latest work on the Filecoin protocol. Before we start, we want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Starkware. Starkware will be putting on the Starkware Sessions in Tel Aviv on September 16th. The event will be bringing together the brightest minds in the field of zero-knowledge proofs from both the academic and application arenas. Topics include self-custodial trading, Starks for Layer 1, Stark-friendly hash functions, and other cool things you can do with Stark proofs. Fun fact, I will actually be hosting one of the stages. So if you're interested in this exciting cutting edge tech, do join the Starkware sessions or come a day early for the Stark 101 workshop where you could actually build a Stark prover from scratch. Use the code ZK podcast to get 20% off any ticket. We have about 50 of these available, so get it fast. As always, info will be in the show notes. So again, thank you Starkware for supporting this podcast. And now, here's our interview with Ariel Gabizon. So this week, we're sitting down with Ariel Gabizon, and it's pretty awesome to have you on the show. You have a, an interesting background. You've worked across a lot of this zero-knowledge space and have done a lot of interesting work in this. So, I mean, you're, you're with the Zcash company from the beginning and migrated to other projects now. Super excited to dig into some of this. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. Given that you are a cryptographer, I think what would be really interesting to hear is those early days of what you were doing maybe in your studies or where have you, where you started to get excited about this. Initially, I, I, I didn't like cryptography. It seemed like a really negative view of the world to me. Like, why is everybody an adversary? It's, it's very depressing, I think. And I think I've actually become more paranoid because of that since I'm doing cryptography. But sort of like if you're deeply in love with someone, you, you'll go, you know, to a nightclub with them, even though you, you don't like to go out, out at night. So I, I fell in love with Bitcoin when I, when I read the Bitcoin white paper. And uh, I saw that, yeah, for, that's where Bitcoin wants to go. So if I want to be with Bitcoin, I have to be there too. Especially since I tried to see, you know, with my skills and my background, uh, how can I best get into this world? So this is, I'm talking at, at 2014. I have to give credit to a friend of mine, Ido Bentov, that already told me about Bitcoin in 2012, but I was too stupid to... Uh, understand it's a really cool thing. And only when I looked at the white paper in 2014, also credit to another friend of mine, Matan Field, which is in the field. Then after I read the white paper, I'm like, okay, I gotta, my life has to intersect with this thing. And since I had a pretty heavy math background for, for, from doing many years of theoretical computer science, the best way for me to contribute or get into this world seemed to be with these zero knowledge proofs or these these snarks as we call them today and practically the the way i did that i was then a postdoc at at uh, technion a university in israel and eli ben sasson which a few years before that i did pure th theory stuff with him was getting into implementing stuff so i approached him and then we worked together for two years on uh, what are now called starks on the the early, early versions, uh, a nice anecdote was when, when, we, when I started working on this, it, it, it would take 10 hours to make a proof about a program that does I++ three times. And of course, we've, we, we, and after that, they have made in Starkware incredible progress on that. That's interesting. So you come from a very academic background. Did you have any sort of developer or programmer job? in between there before like digging into Bitcoin world or did you come purely from the academic space? Purely from the academic space. Uh, I liked to program as a child, but I had a really long break from programming, at least until I joined Ellie's uh, Stark project. And then I was getting back to it a little. 
So you had said you were excited about the Bitcoin white paper, but were there any other papers or concepts along the way that got you really excited? Sort of the paper that got me into theoretical computer science in general, of which I would say cryptography is a subfield, because before that I was more into the direction of AI and, uh, you know, brain research, maybe even. This was a classical paper that in a sense, I would view it as the paper that started this whole field of SNARKs from 1990, a paper of uh, Lund, Fortno, Karloff, Nissan. This was the first paper with an example of how we can get uh, what we can call an exponential speed up in verification. So what this paper did is, I, I like, suppose I want to prove to you there, that some Sudoku puzzle doesn't have a solution. The natural way to do that is you try all solutions and see that none of them work. So this paper gave an efficient method where a verifier can quickly without going over all possibilities, be convinced that a certain problem, generally speaking, a certain Cohen-P problem is like unsatisfiable. It would be maybe a bit of a stretch, but not much of a stretch that everything we're seeing up to this point, the snarks of today, you know, after that paper, how much can we leverage these? How much can we milk out of these ideas? And that milking uh, has brought, I think, all the beautiful developments we, we've seen since then. The Starks, the Snarks, the use of pairings. The... So you joined, uh, you, you fell in love with Bitcoin, then you joined Ellie in his quest of Starks. How did you go from there into like Zcash and, and these other projects? Well, so we were working on the Starks for about two years. I was working also with Alessandro Chiesa, who works with Ellie, and I, I was visiting uh, Berkeley. And then he arranged a meeting with uh, Nathan, the, the CTO of, of Zcash, now Electric Coin Company. I think on the one hand, I felt at that point, I, I may have been wrong, that the Starks are, it's going to take time for them to get into practice. It may be happening faster than I thought at the time. I exactly, after talking to Nathan, I thought, okay, they have this maybe little hole they need to fill of someone with some, a certain math background to help with this MPC for the parameters. A little after that, they contacted me about a part-time job. Uh, and it seemed a good point for me to try something a little outside of academia. What year is that? So this was, I joined Zcash part-time in 2016, June or July. What was that like? It was, it was really, really good. So the first few months, I was basically only working with uh, Sean Bow on how to do this MPC. So this is the original trusted setup ceremony where there were like six parties involved or something like that. And like the initial parameters set were set up. This is not the powers of Tao thing that came later. Yeah, this is the original setup. So basically what we had to do, there was a, a paper by five of the Zcash scientists, uh, Eli Ben Sasson, Al Alessandro Chiesa, Mother Svirza, Aaron Tromer, and Matt Green uh, about how to, do, how to do a setup for, for snog par parameters. I guess a lot of the work of those few months was how to, I guess, translate the ideas of that paper with a, a few simplifications into code. I, I think what I did most effectively was sort of being a, a translator between math papers that are written in some slightly more abstract general setting to getting the exact code you need in a certain, in a certain case. That's a pattern that I see in a lot of our guests and people we talk to and people I talk to in this space in general. The most valuable people are those that can read a paper and translate it into code. It's apparently a very rare talent. I wonder if it's rare or it's that at least till a few years ago, the people with that skill were just not, you know, communicating with engineers. And I wonder if that's still, like today, you look here at Zcon, you have a lot of people who can also implement things and understand the, the papers. Though perhaps another side of it is now, I think academics are very much aware that their paper might be implemented the day after they uh, publish it. 
So they're more careful to actually make it uh, implementable. <laughs> yeah, or maybe they they try to write it in a way that's yeah that's clear how to implement. I'm curious. I I don't actually know this. What was the initial setup written in? Was it C plus plus or was Rust already on the table back then? It, it was all written in Rust. That, that's cool. So where did you go within the company after that? You said you sort of started like almost as a part-timer on this and then kind of got fully into the company, I guess. How was that transition and and working on the protocol itself and not just these outlying things? I found when I moved to full-time, I found it a pretty good balance of being able to alternate according to, you know, what I felt like at the moment from doing a more just pure math thing, prove like prove that this thing is secure or understand this complicated algebra algorithm to writing code, understanding, you know, things with git better and and cherry picking. Uh like there was a period where I was focusing on writing this snark explainer series periods where I was writing papers or understanding papers. And then, you know, a period was where, where I was just trying to port things from, from Bitcoin doing that for, for a month, a month and a half. I think sometimes then what would happen is a, a better, you know, engineer would redo what I did in, in a day, but, uh, um, so it was nice variation from the more programming side to the theory side. Did you beforehand, did you have like a very strong uh, interest in privacy? Was that part of the reason why you joined the project or was it purely the the math and the engineering? No, I, I don't care about privacy. I just do zero knowledge for fun. <laughs> I, I never cared about privacy and, and still don't. I, I always found the more interesting thing in snarks to be the the compression aspect and actually the the specific the specific thing that one specific thing that got me into these zk snarks is the the compression problem you know like how do you you know this data on these block uh, chains keeps aggregating and uh, snarks seems to be the the perfect solution for this so I mean, given your own background coming from an academic background, we had Sean on the episode before he comes from like dropping out of high school. Uh, do you still think an academic background is needed or is it helpful or should like, what would your recommendation be to someone who wants to get involved with this? Just like sit down and read papers or actually get an education? It's definitely not needed. Uh, I think it's good to have people with different backgrounds to give different points of view. I mean, also in academia, there's this sort of sliding scale in how formally people are are doing doing things. Uh, I think people, yeah, whatever interests you most, you should you should try to directly get into that and fill the holes going backward. I think it's much, even I heard this interview with this Fields medalist, uh, you know, mathematician that, you know, there was this problem who, that interested him, this big math problem. So he read this super advanced paper as a, an undergrad, and, and of course he couldn't understand 90% of it, so he kept have to, had to go, go back to, and I, but I think, you know, the way the brain, what keeps the brain engaged and therefore efficient is always go to what interests you most and fill the holes. Because if you say to yourself, oh, okay, I need now like four years of basic background before I get into what interests me, your, your brain won't be as engaged. If uh, there's nothing specific that you want to do at this moment, I think getting a good math background in academia is is a great great way to to spend time i think that helped me a lot looking back over your time at zcash you know what what kind of work did you see yourself doing there that you like would highlight a really nice thing we 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 did at at zcash was well there were a few things so there was this huge problem in in the first mpc that the participants needed to be defined in advance and protect their secrets throughout the protocol, which limited the number of participants to a very small number. 
and then in this paper with uh, Sean and Ian Myers, uh, we showed that, you know, this odd thing that if you, I guess this is the oddities of what you need for a security proof, even though it sometimes seems ridiculous in, in real life. So what we showed in, in that paper, uh, I think the paper is called, if you look for it on GitHub or ePrint, uh, Scalable ZK Snark Parameter Generation in the Random Beacon Model. So right in this ceremony, everybody contributes their secret randomness to create some elements. We showed that if in the end you, you take another contribution from just a, a public source of randomness, then even though the secret of that contribution is totally exposed, that creates a situation where, where you can do the security proof uh, without everybody having to pre-commit to the randomness. And then that led to this powers of Tao ceremony where just you want to participate and hopefully you're the honest person. So, you, you know, you dynamically can say, I want to participate now, do your computation for 20 minutes and that's it. So one of the things that you might be most well known for, hopefully not, <laughs> but it's certainly known for, is discovering the bug in the Zcash protocol. How did how was that discovered, and like what happened after that? Yeah. So uh, the the snark the Zcash the Sprout Zcash system originally used was from a paper of four authors. Uh, also from the Zcash scientist, uh, that was a small variant of a, a, a previous snark. And I guess because it was a really small variant, uh, that was maybe one reason why there wasn't a security proof in that paper. So in the paper about the Sprout MPC, I, I wrote in an appendix a proof of, for the first time, perhaps a, a proof of security for this, uh, for this snark. And this paper got accepted to this Bitcoin workshop in Financial Cryptography 218. Uh, so I came there to give a talk. And the night before the talk, just sort of as nostalgically going over the paper that we've written, I went through this appendix because I was really proud that I, I wrote this proof. And then I suddenly saw that there was this one, you know, line in the proof that that didn't make sense, like that I was saying something like, oh, and because of this algebra thing, then the only solution must be with these things in the beginning of the solution. And then I was like, no, that doesn't really follow from the algebra. And then uh, I thought, well, so what does that mean? It seems that, that means that if in the Zcash context, if you have like a, a Zcash transaction where you're spending a tenth of a Zec, you can change it to a Zcash transaction where you're spending a billion Zec by just, you know, adding some group element to your proof and it's all fine. Uh, so, so then I, I it, would, it would happen often that, you know, something wouldn't make sense to me. And I, you know, since today, you know, the internet, everything is so hand, you know, handy, you know, instead of sorting it out in my head for 15 minutes, I would immediately ask Sean or someone. So I wrote Sean, Hey, I, I don't think this, you know, this doesn't seem to make sense. Like, it seems like the system is completely broken. And usually he would, you know, immediately tell me why it's not broken. And he wrote, Oh, well, you know, this, this mitigates it. But I said, no, because, uh, you know, you can use this, this thing to, to pass this check. And then he, he stopped using Slack. He, he wrote me on, on Signal, I'm coming to meet you. We were, by chance, uh, me, Sean, and Zuko all in Curacao in this hotel of the, of the conference. Uh, yeah, I won't. I think Sean told a lot of the story fr from here. Uh, he, he met me in person. We verified it's a, it's a bug. Uh, we had some disagreement on, on how to patch it, uh, but it, it worked out. That's actually a really good clarification that you say here. So the paper that you're referencing, that was actually an older paper and the implementation, everything had happened after that. And this was you at a conference looking over an older paper, looking closer at an older paper. Uh, oh, sorry. I, so the paper with the 
broken protocol was there a few years before. Uh, the, the paper with the attempted proof was something I wrote with Sean and Matt Green, and that was pretty new, and, and that was what I was presenting in, in that. Uh, so, oh, I see. So it was like looking at this newer paper, finding the f kind of inconsistency in the newer paper that made you go back to that older paper, and then you found out that through, as I had understood it, through the implementation, sort of part of it had been ignored. Um. So there's a technicality of, of how to exploit that relates to the implementation. Uh, but the error in my proof, yeah, made me go back to the, this protocol from this older paper and see that the, the protocol is, is broken. So the problem yeah, actually existed in the original paper. The problem was always there. And the proof just sort of highlighted that problem in some sense. Exactly. So you already mentioned that, you know, there are ways to patch this and we've seen what actually happened. I mean, it was a patch was delayed and then they kind of rewrote all, like the whole snark from scratch and then it was fixed at the same time. Um, but what other ways are would there have been to fix this? And like it was a nine month period or something like that between discovering it and, and patching it. Why was that wait so long? Uh, so the wait was long uh, because the idea was to fix it covertly as part of a big efficiency upgrade, the sapling upgrade. And this sapling upgrade was a big change uh, requiring a lot of time. Uh, the The fix... I suggested was, I called it the re-randomization uh, fix. Uh, so that wouldn't require, would require only changing the, what's called the proving and verifying key, like the parameters, but would not require changing the proving system or, so it wouldn't, requ it wouldn't require really changing any of the code. But if you're changing the parameters, you need another trusted setup to change those parameters. So you would need uh, another, yeah, more participants that would re-randomize the parameters. Uh, but while they're re-randomizing, they would not do the re-randomization on the what Sean and Zuko call the bypass elements, the elements that let you carry out the attack. And so you're, you're left with new parameters where the, these element, where you can't carry out the attack anymore. And then the question is, what security do you get? Well, you get that for someone who doesn't know the vulnerability, he cannot exploit unless he's corrupted all the original six Sprout participant, ceremony participants and whom, whomever has done this re-randomization. And you get that even someone that knows the exploit to, to now attack the system needs, uh, needs to know the secrets of everybody who participated in this re-randomization. So kind of my logic was even if we just do one round of this re-randomization, it, it wouldn't hurt the trust model anymore because in any case, since we knew about the exploit, there was a period in time where you needed to trust us. Uh, and the idea that this could still be presented at a semi-lame uh, update you know covert update yeah i mean that that's a question to me because how you know in this world where there is an exploit you have to do covertly you don't want to tell anyone that there is a problem if you suddenly just go oh uh, by the way we're gonna you know redo all the parameters uh it's, it's no big deal how, how do you do that covertly so so my i agree like semi-lame co cover-up story was that so this thing that we call the toxic waste in the original Sprout, it, con it consists of eight field elements. 
And the advantage of this re-randomization re 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 is that without redoing a whole ceremony with rounds, with just one person doing one round, five out of these eight toxic elements, you can re-randomize such that now you need all of this, the six original people and the new person to, to discover one of these five. Now, I think what uh, maybe Sean said, which is a good argument, is that if... So you could say, all right, we're doing this parameter change that maybe doesn't really increase security, but there's a chance it does and it doesn't hurt security. So we're just doing it, you know, for extra safety. Uh, yeah, I think the argument against that, that perhaps Sean said that if you do an update where you're increasing the security of five out of the eight toxic elements, it could be a hint to people, hmm, maybe there's an attack relating to using one of these five and yeah. then looking with a magnifying glass at this uh old old paper relative a few years be 2013 or 14 paper and and discovering the attack themselves and there's a window for attack there between when you announce we're going to do this re-randomization and when it's actually done and live on the network that uh, that someone could dig into this and try to yeah, find it yeah i guess it's a question of how much details you have to give about why you're changing the parameters. Yeah, right. You could just not say anything and then suddenly, you know, next week yeah, there's there's an upgrade and this is new parameters and like everything and then detail afterwards. Yeah, I think it could because there was this overwinter upgrade that was much nearer in the future than sapling. So yeah, you could have said maybe a week before, oh, by the way, we're doing this parameter change. It only increases, at least it doesn't hurt security. Maybe it increases it. So we're just doing it for like, why not? Yeah. Uh, there was, I think, an argument of the other, yeah, that I think the other three that were in on this, uh, Zuko, Nathan, and Sean, you know, that something like this would make people really raise their eyebrows and, you know, what's going on. And maybe that would have evolved to some drama or problem or who knows let's say you did announce it a, a week before and like how likely is it that anyone would actually be able to find it in a week even with a magnifying glass and knowing you know there's probably something here and digging into it, do you think anyone would be able to find the bug um i, I don't i don't think it's likely i i yeah i still think this was the the, the better route uh you know, given that it would re would have reduced the exposure time from, I think it was nine months to two months. And also the, this nine months, you were putting the sapling upgrade in a pressure cooker to, you know, roll it out fast, which increases the, the chance of introducing a bug, you know, in, in this new upgrade. I mean, it's really not that, okay, we've just got to take care of this bug and then we can breathe. And these things are so sensitive. I mean, you're writing, right, this thing we call R1CS. You're writing, a, you know, the logic of a valid transaction in like, in Sprout, it was 2 million. In Sapling, it's like 70,000 degree two equations. And it's enough to get one equation wrong for, you know, potentially unlimited counterfeiting. Uh, yeah, basically, it wasn't only about someone finding an attack that week. It was maybe about some PR and media. Yeah, basically, I, I, I still like that route better, personally. Do you think that there was anything that could have been done beforehand to catch this thing, other than just, like, getting more eyes on it? Like, would something like formal verification have helped? Would that have just been too crazy to do on something like this? Oh yeah, that, that's a great question. So actually, I mean, I did, I discovered, got to the bug through a relative, relatively subtle process of, of going over this proof, but simple sanity checks would have mitigated it. The simplest check that every compiler does of, do we have unused variables? So in a sense, in this 2014 uh, paper, there were 
unused variables in this uh, in this in these parameters that made everything look like more symmetric and the all the indices were you know in in the same range so but just that simple check for example w would have found this bug and another thing there's this thing called the generic group model which in a sense is a stronger cryptography assumption than the snark used in sprout the pinocchio slash bctv one but i think you know proofs proofs in the, in the generic group model it's totally possible they can be mechanized and even if you want to later prove your system secure with a weaker assumption you if someone will write such a computer program that could be a great sanity check before we segue into talking about some of the stuff that you're working on now just looking back at this work What's your takeaway in designing and building these systems to make them secure? Because, it, like you said, it's obviously extremely tricky to get all of this right. Like, how do you, what's the best way to design these systems? Uh, I don't really know. To be completely blunt and honest, I'm less worried about it because the crypto space is so volatile anyway that an individual user i speculate is not going to lose more from these exploits than they do from the crashes of price so um, <laughs> yeah it's not a problem we have to solve today <laughs> this is more general but now that time has passed and you've since left the zcash company or now the electric coin company um Looking back, what's your feeling? I, I think the, the, these years in the Zcash company, it was a really unique and special time. I sometimes describe it, used to describe it as taking a, a cartoon comics character and bringing him into real life. These, the ZK snarks were really just living in theory papers and, and suddenly seeing them at all in the real world when Zcash launched and then seeing that it's not an incredibly small niche. There's suddenly so many people interested in it. Um, it really felt like a taking part in a pioneering revolution. Yeah. The landscape has changed and there's a lot of good projects who 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 were influenced and uh maybe will someone else will take it to the you know next level i think that segues us uh well into the next thing i want to talk about which is you're now working for protocol labs on the filecoin project which is interesting because earlier you said you don't actually care all that much about privacy and you're much more excited about the compression effects of a snark which is kind of what you're doing in Filecoin, right? Right. In Filecoin, we need to do these proofs of replication, uh, which is this problem of, I want to prove to you not only that I'm storing your file, but that I'm storing several independent copies of your file, which is a very tricky problem because the natural way for you to check if I'm storing your file is to have some, say, Merkle root commitment to it and ask random indices. But that will not separate between me storing one copy and five copies. So it turns out you can still do these proofs of replications using something called slow encodings. But it translates to incredibly long, these proofs of replication that you've really done a slow encoding of a file and this is its Merkle root. These proofs are extremely long. So it's basically a Merkle proof, which includes like paths to the leaves in this Merkle tree uh, and like one piece of data. And I guess the Merkle trees in this case are massive. So the, le the paths are really long. It's massive Merkle trees and it's 11 of them <laughs> because to, to get this security and this proof of replication, you have to start with your original file which in the Filecoin context can be a one gigabyte or even 64 gigabyte file. And you have to do 10 layers of slow encoding on this file. So, so you do 
the slow encoding of the file, the slow encoding of the slow encoding. And each time when you're doing this, you have the Merkle root of the current thing and the more encoded thing. And you have to check with a bunch of Merkle paths that really the index here in the new thing is the right combination of like three, two or three things in the old thing. So you end up with a lot, a lot of deep Merkle paths. And I think a circuit of about a billion gates. Wow. So this, this uh, is circuit then goes to prove that the Merkle proof is correct. That's what yes. you're proving. So, so maybe I, I skipped. So, so first, right, you could say, so it's not about privacy. So you could, you could, the, the proof that everything is correct is just a ton of deep Merkle paths. And there's no need, no, nobody cares about hiding them. It's just that you don't want to write hundreds of deep step, I think if it's maybe 30 Merkle paths on, on your blockchain. Uh, every time, uh, say, a miner is, is proving he's storing a certain file because the, the file coin has the idea is to combine two things at once. One is like incentivize people to store clients' files uh, and, and get paid for that and at the same time get mining power according to the, the amount of space they're allocating for the, uh, for the network. Uh, so yeah, you don't want each miner to like put all these huge Merkle paths on the chain, so you have to compress them in a snark. Right. Like in a normal blockchain, your proof of work is just a hash. It's 256 bits. And you know, this is the proof that this block is correct. But in the Filecoin world, you would need this massive Merkle proof to say, I'm storing this file. Here's my proof. So instead, you compress all of this with a snark. So now you're just storing the much smaller snark on chain to say that proves that my Merkle proof is correct. Exactly. In some conversations earlier this week, we also started talking about this recursive level one. Is there anything like, is, is that related at all to what you're talking about here? Oh, yeah, this is very much related. Okay. So like I said, I think we end up with a circuit of about a billion gates. And uh, the prover computation and memory, well, mainly here the thing is the prover memory is linearly re related to the circuit size. So it's very hard unless I think you rent a special machine on AWS and pay s significant money to even run this proof. So the natural thing to do is, since really this big, huge circuit is just a lot of copies of the same thing, a lot of these Merkle paths. So the natural thing is, you know, just split the big circuit into 20 smaller circuits. Uh, and then the, the memory requirements go down by 20. Uh, but then you've lost in scalability because now you're going to post 20 snark proofs on the chain instead of one. Uh, so you can solve this by one layer of snark recursion, uh, meaning that except these 20 now slightly somewhat smaller circuits, you'll have another circuit where what's going on inside this, this circuit is a verification of 20 proofs. It's kind of similar to the Zexi structure that in, in their construction, you have these, you have the UTXO model, you have inputs and outputs, an arbitrary amount of them in a transaction. And then you have one snark for each input and output, but then one like overlaying snark over all of them to prove that all of those are correct. It's, it's similar, and, and it's not a coincidence that we're using some of the Zexi code base to, to get this done, which is proven really useful also for this and also in another project I'm involved in uh, called Celo for building an ultralight uh, client for blockchain verification. How long would it take to compute, like on, on, like you said, on a beefy Amazon machine or something, how long would it take to com compute this proof that if you were to make one mega proof of everything? I may have been getting this totally wrong. I, I don't remember the times. I think I remember the, the money they paid for the AWS machine that made one of these proofs was around $1,000. Wow. I hope I'm not getting this wrong. Yeah, uh, but I mean, signi significance, and I assume most of that then is RAM, and, and RAM machines are super expensive on Amazon. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was clearly not good enough when it was just one billion gate circuit. Yeah. 
How, what's the speed up in doing this recursive level thing then? The speed up is not large, unfortunately. It's mainly about saving memory. Yeah, so you can do it on a home computer and you don't need the, the massive RAM machine. Yeah, exactly. I'm curious. I mean, we've had Howard Wu on before to talk about DZIC and distributing all of this. It sounds like this can still be applied because, like you say, privacy is not an issue here. Like, I can send this massive Merkle tree around to a bunch of machines, even to other service providers, off-chain, and say, construct this snark for me, and then just submit that on-chain. So, so I know Protocol Labs made some investigation on using DZIC and came to a conclusion that it wasn't practical in this case, and I, I, I don't know the details well. I don't understand DZIC well. That might be a future uh, Filecoin business model is compute pr proofs for you and uh, take a small cut of the mining rewards. Yeah. <laughs> could, you, could, could you recurse another level if you wanted to? Like when we talked about that recursive level one, it's the, we had had Coda on and they talked a little bit about what recursion was, but could you not just kind of do two in order uh, to make that... The thing Even is, more efficient? Yeah, great question. So the thing is, our elliptic curve knowledge is very limited and in this sense. And who knows, maybe it will improve a lot. And maybe we should get more, encourage some elliptic curve experts to look into this. But with the current thing we, we know, which is this thing called the Cox pinch method, basically, in this method, every time you add enough, like one more layer of recursion, you need to double the field size over which the curve is over, which means doubling your everything you're putting on the chain and increasing computation time by, I don't know if it will be just doubling or maybe a, a bigger factor, four or five. Did you look into any other proving systems initially when like exploring this space of, because you, you want something succinct, but you don't necessarily care about like when we talk to zexy there's a very you know particular requirements that the proof doesn't depend on input size because then you leak privacy details and things like that. you don't have those concerns here really uh so actually what i'm mo most excited about in the filecoin uh context is even don't look at general purpose proving systems like uh, when you think about what you need sort of in this Filecoin context, it's, it's this thing we can call a vector commitment, that you, you have this vector of values and uh, you, you have a short commitment to it. And then you can just, I ask you, what is the 40th, prove to me you know the 40th index and you can give me a short proof uh, that this is the, the 40th index. So. Uh, Merkle, Merkle trees are the traditional way to do this, but there's a really exciting developments on alternatives that Protocol Labs is looking into. One really nice direction is these is, um, vector commitments based on RSA accumulators that have gotten a lot of uh, attention lately uh, uh, in, the, in the space, I think, because of scalability work of Benedict Bones and uh, Dan Bonet and others. Uh, another direction I like a lot that I learned about when I learned uh, uh, initially from Mary Maller about the, the Sonic paper is this thing called the Kate et al. polynomial scheme, polynomial commitment scheme that has actually been used in the recent years in, in many places, for example, in giving us the first practical uh, universal snarks. Yeah, I would love to do a whole episode on accumulators at some point because it's a fascinating topic. It's also like the core problem in a lot of blockchains when it comes to implementation. Like what's really challenging, like in Ethereum, there's a Merkle tree for all of the global state and it's getting to be really, really big. And it's one of these, uh, like it's one of the hardest things about implementing an ethereum node is managing this merkle tree and if we could have something other than a merkle tree that isn't so complicated to manage then it would be 
like in, in my point of view from like an, a blockchain implementer's perspective not having to deal with merkle trees would be revolutionary yeah i think one an interesting thing if you look at the zcash circuit you know which is you know snarks give you general circuits it om- well almost cheating a bit it boils down to you need a pr- something with a proof of membership like that really this note you're spending its commitment is in this commitment tree and you need a proof of non-membership that this serial number of this thing you're spending is not in this list of serial numbers of spent coins so i think this is an exciting sort of direction of uh instead of doing things with generic snarks maybe even things like like zcash you can do with some variant of rsa accumulators or other accumulators so we're getting really close to the end here um but is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up so there's a story i really like to tell about pairings so elliptic curve pairings uh really gave us an order of magnitude jump on how efficient like zero knowledge proofs and and snarks can be and and really had a, a huge part in bringing them to into practice uh, and I like to tell the story of how mathematicians who didn't care at all about cryptography and invented them totally by accident. And it, it all starts with Riemann, who was the question he was interested in, which was, is maybe the most fundamental question in math, at least in number theory, is say I'm at some number, you know, 17, how many numbers do I have to, to go forward from 17 to hit another prime? You know, so so we know uh, about the density of primes, but the Holy Grail is giving an exact formula for when the next prime will appear. And what I think not everybody knows is that Riemann, in fact, found an exact formula, which is one of the most amazing things in math ever. Uh, well, with the slight caveat that there are infinitely many unknowns in this formula, as part of this formula. And these unknowns are the zeros of the, what's called the Riemann zeta function. This made, you know, finding what these zeros are perhaps the most interesting question in mathematics. And what m- mathematicians noticed after, I guess, trying to work on this is that, well, we don't know how to solve this problem, but this Riemann zeta function, you can actually think about it as the Riemann zeta function of the rational numbers. And actually, you can take a lot of other fields and also define a zeta function for them. And then maybe this question about where the zeros are of these zeta functions is easier. So in this kind of direction, people started looking at what's called uh, function fields which are these weird fields where your elements are, they're not exactly numbers. They're like, say, rational functions in just the variable x, like x divided by 1 plus x cubed will be an element of this field. And then you have this very weird thing that, like you can take the real numbers and add like the square root of minus 1, you can take this field of rational functions and add a square root of this variable x, which sounds really, really weird, but just formally it's something you can do. So these fields are what's called algebraic function fields. And people thought, hmm, maybe if I look at the zeta function of these algebraic function fields, it's easier to, to say where the zeros are, and that will be like a nice start uh, so, so Hase, this mathematician, showed that, oh, well, for elliptic function fields, you know, these are exactly the, the values of the zeros. And on the way, totally incidentally, he, he, you know, this gave us a fact that all of elliptic curve cryptography is based on, that say I want an elliptic curve with a certain number of bits, what do I do? Well, you just define an elliptic curve over a certain field of size p, and then you're guaranteed by Hasse's theorem that the, the size of the curve will also be roughly p up to a 2 square root p uh, factor in either direction. 
And then, well, elliptic function fields were a special case of algebraic function fields. So then this big question of these mathematicians, I think mainly in Germany in the 20s and 30s, was can we prove what's called the Riemann hypothesis for all algebraic function fields over finite fields? Uh, like, can we say where these zeros are, or at least bound their range for any algebraic function field, for the zeta function of any algebraic function field? And a famous French mathematician, maybe one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, André Vey, uh, it's spelled with an L, but I learned recently you don't pronounce the L in the end. Uh, he solved this question. And just as one step in, in his proof, he defined what's called the Vey pairing, uh, which has become really the basis of all, uh, all we can do today with, with SNARKs and this Kate polynomial scheme and BLS signatures and... So I think that's just a, a nice story of how, you know, these things developed in math mathematics and gave us the tools we need for, for totally unrelated reasons. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Sure. Thanks. Do you think now you're part of that, like that story in a weird way? Uh, in, in a very, very small way of like standing on the shoulders of giant and peaking a millimeter, millimeter above that's why you stay in school kids <laughs> all right very cool thank you very much for being on the show it's been a pleasure yeah it's been fun thank you and to our listeners thanks for listening thanks for listening <laughs>